Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we have a discussion on the release of the new book on the notorious Rafal deal written by uh, Ravi Nair and Paranjay Guha Thakurta. And we have both the authors with us uh, today for this uh, discussion. And uh, as viewers of News Click will know, uh, this uh, portal has covered the Rafal story in many different ways from different angles over the years. And this gives us an opportunity to tie all this together. So let me begin uh, by asking uh, Ravi. The book right from the outset lays out a pattern of uh, twisting of procedures, decisions taken in one way while well, the rationale is some other and so on. But an overarching focus is what may be described as corruption. While the book itself, including several prefaces, forewords, etc., says the word corruption itself can mean many things. Yes, exactly. It means uh, financial impropriety. It means uh, twisting of institutions. It means uh, breakdown of uh, uh, institutional processes and so on. To your mind, which dimension of corruption stands out the most to you? First of all, uh, thank you so much, Raku, for inviting us for uh, this discussion. When we speak about corruption, it has uh, different dimensions. Uh, Agar Patel and N. Ram clearly mentioned that right. in the book, in the foreword and uh, the preface. In this case, the, the, uh, when we call it a scandal, in the entire saga of this buying 36 Rafal, all the checks and balances were negated and one man unilaterally took the decision. That is Prime Minister Narendra Modi. The buck stops with him. So the biggest, uh, there are two aspects to it again. One, he violated all the set rules, ignored it, twisted it using uh, uh, the so-called uh, uh, IT cell and its uh, ruling party's IT cell and its missionary supportive media. And by doing so, it created a huge loss to the exchequer by paying uh, almost 50% higher than uh, 40, 42%, 41-42% higher than what the benchmark price was decided. So these are the two main aspects in the corruption. So these are corruption actually. When Corruption, it's not only mean that, you know, when we speak about corruption, it's not only that um, somebody got the commission, we have no money trail in That's this. right. Okay, that's that's not the only corruption. Yeah, sure. Puranjai, same question to you. And I think Ram mentions this in his uh, introductory remarks as well, that in the previous major defense scam, the Beaufort's uh, issue, you had something like a money trail, uh, which, as uh, uh, Ravi just said, doesn't seem to be so obvious uh, in this case. Uh, but what do you think uh, is the highlight of what you would call corruption? Okay. Now, thank you once again, uh, Raghu, for asking us to speak on our book. It took us almost five years to put it together. I think the overarching theme when you talk about corruption, goes beyond financial corruption. Right. We look at how one person, in this case the Prime Minister, he bypassed procedures, he compromised institutions on his own. In the process, he, in the name of national security, what happened was that national security was actually compromised. So, words that were uttered and the actual actions were just the opposite. On top of that, you had a situation 
where the announcement was first made, apparently without the knowledge of people who should be in the new, including his own defense minister at that time, Manohar Parikar, including the foreign secretary, including the IMF. And after having made the announcement, you then try and justify everything post facto. Then you get the entire process in place. And lastly, I think what is significant is what we found, and not us alone, everybody's found this particularly notable, is that how is it that a corporate group with no prior experience of manufacturing defense equipment, including fighter aircraft, a group which was bankrupt, steeped in debt, how is it that half the deal, which was roughly 60,000 crore, and we saw that half of the deal, the offsets part of it, was given to this particular group, namely the ADAG, the Anil Dhirubhai Ambani group, headed by Mr. Anil Ambani. And last but not the least, I think what this book tries to do is how we saw institutions that are meant to serve as institutions that provide checks and balances for all high value acquisitions of capital equipment, how they chose not to look at what was staring at them in the face. And that includes the Supreme Court of India, the highest court of the country, and a constitutional body called the Controller and Auditor General of India. And one last point, what was particularly astonishing, and I should say it really is mind boggling, is how an unsigned document was given in a sealed envelope which contained lies and this was swallowed by the Supreme Court. The Apex Court at that time, the Chief Justice of India was Mr. Gogoi, Ranjan Gogoi. How he completely swallowed those lies that were put out and later on the government had to correct the judgment. Request for the correction. That's right. Of the judgment. That the and CAGs, was, yes. Uh, let me add, it was not a note, unsigned note, it was bullet points. That's right. It was bullet points given in a, on a sealed envelope to the Supreme Court, S not signed, no date. Probably they didn't want uh, you know, the officers to be yeah, prosecuted yeah. for perjury. Yeah. So that's why. Uh, let me add here. <clears throat> When you asked about the money trail, and you said that uh, in the case of Bofors, there was a money trail established. In the case of Bofors, Swedish radio leaked it. Yeah. Here, there's an investigation right now going on in France. In France, we did, which we don't know yet. And, and um, as per the la last information, we tried to put a small piece of that in the book. Uh, as per the last available information, the investigating authority tried to raid the SA office and um, uh, Ministry of uh, External Affairs there. And it was stopped, citing, uh, they were blocked, citing national security and um, foreign relations. Yeah. Other aspect to the money trail, it is very clear and obvious that there, there were, uh, there are, there's a very infamous uh, power broker or arms broker, arms dealer's involvement in the entire deal. Sushen Gupta. Sushen Mohan Gupta. This person was booked uh, in the Augusta Westland case and uh, he was in jail for almost two, two and a half months, released on bail. And in this case, even after his involvement was very clearly put into public domain, the government didn't touch. And the biggest question here is if the government is clear that nothing is uh, wrong with the deal, they did everything perfect as per the law as per the laid down procedures, there is no money trail involved. Why the government is skeptical or scared to order an inves investigation? According to for Mr. Prashant Bhushan, Arun Shauri and Mr. Yashwan Sinha who filed the who petition, filed the petition the court. To, uh, to the court. Before that they went to CBI. And, and soon after that, and, the and CBI when said, director... When they said, when they, uh, said that, the, when CBI director, the then CBI director, decided to uh, start a preliminary investigation on that day, we, we, we can we can survive. We can only surmise. That's yeah. Right. That because what happened is 
after the petition was given by Prashant Bhushan, Arun Shori and Yashwan Sena to the then director of the Central Bureau of Investigation, Alok Verma, soon after that, there was a most unusual development, literally a midnight coup. That's right. In, in the middle of the night, his doors, uh, his his office was uh, locked. Yeah. So we can sort of connect the dots and make these. Yeah. Uh, in a sense. Other than other than that, yeah. there was no reason for the government to remove the then CBI director. There was no other reason at all. Yeah. Uh, Though the government claims that it was his fight with his deputy, right. Mr. Uh, let, let me put this another way. Uh, we have known not only in the Rafal case, but in many other instances of governance in this government that it is a rule by uh, administrative fiat, if you like, uh, and a presidential form of governance rather than a cabinet form of governance with checks and balances and so on. This is run like uh, a presidential system where the White House is the executive authority and that's how those government runs and we've seen that in a number of uh, cases. A defense, even though it may not be stated in so many words in this case, I think from the government side throughout has been. Yes, the government took an executive decision and which proves how determined and strong this government is that it does not allow red tape to come in the way of firm decision making in the interests of the nation. That I think is the stated or unstated no, it's uh, stated, in fact. version of the government. Raghu, uh, uh, yeah. in a democracy, yes. one man is not the government. Yeah. We are an electoral democracy. The parliamentary largest democracy, parliamentary it's got democracy. checks and exactly. balances in exactly. the system. Exactly. In this case, immediately after the announcement of the Prime Minister from Paris on 10th April 2015, in the next two weeks, we have detailed it in the book. If you just observe what the then Defence Minister Manohar Parikar, late Manohar Parikar said, every, in every single interview, whether it's to Doordarshan, whether it's to uh, CNBC, whether it's to NDTV, whether it's to Ashtak, uh, India Today group, uh, he was categorical. This was a decision by a strong leader. Yeah. And this was an outcome yep. of the discussion between the Indian Prime Minister, that is Narendra Modi, and the then French President, That's right. France Yoholon. Yeah. Right? So, where is the checks and balances? He yeah. decided. Yeah. I, I can just add something yeah. here. Yeah. In the launch of, the, when we launched the book, on Monday, the 5th of December at the Constitution Club here in New Delhi, we had as one of the speakers, uh, the retired Colonel of the Indian Army, Ajay Shukla. We've quoted him extensively yes. in the book because he's he's also featured on News Click. That's right. He's written and a lot he made, about And he made a very important revelation. He said, I'm saying this for the first time. Mr. Parikar is no more with us. He's passed on. He said there was a person who was with Mr. Parikar on a particular day when he got a telephone call and he was on his way to catch a flight to Goa. That's right. And he went back to the PMO and he says, and this is Mr. Ajay Shukla telling us, Colonel Ajay Shukla telling us, that he was shocked. I mean, yes, his your, face was ashen. Your book, your book uses the phrase, he came back ashen face. Ashen that's face. right. That's right. That meeting. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So the defense minister of yeah. the country is uh, uh, having an idea about the earlier deal is getting scrapped and a new one is being announced exactly a week prior to Prime Minister's announcement. This was happened on yes. 3rd April. That's right. Another example what we can cite here is that uh, whenever the Prime Minister travel abroad on official visits, there's a customary uh, press briefing by the Foreign Secretary. He'll explain uh, to the media, the press, that custom, uh, the itinerary of the Prime Minister's visit and what he is going to discuss, what are the topics. Uh, he'll meet whom all these things are explained to the media because these are pre-decided. He's the prime minister of country. In this case, just uh, two days prior to prime minister's uh, visit to Paris and the three countries, the then foreign secretary, Dr. S. Jay Shankar, who is, who is now the external affairs minister, briefed the press on that particular press meet. There were three questions raised 
on Rafal, the deal, uh, whether the Prime Minister will be announcing a new deal, he categorically said no, because the Prime Minister's visit don't uh, you know, go into these go into small, 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 small issues like this. And of course, it is not going to happen. And the discussions are on with HAL, Ministry of Defense, DESO, and uh, other various uh, set up who are in involved in this. And 10th? The announcement is announcement. made. Yeah. So, uh, given this narrative from the government that we took a decision, bold decision was taken in national interest because there was an emergency requirement for aircraft. There were all kinds of delays earlier. So we took this decision. Your book contains a series of interviews scattered across the different chapters with uh, leading military figures, retired people, sitting serving officers, uh, the strategic analysts and defense commentators. What is your take after all these interviews that you've had? Was the national interest in defense served by this decision? Uh, shall I respond? Yeah, yeah so I'll, my, I'll my, add on later. Yeah, yeah. you add sure. on. We believe the contrary happened, that the national interest was not served, that the country's security environment was weakened by this deal. As you have rightly pointed out, we've quoted several experts serving and retired, those who spoke to us on the record, those who spoke to us off the record. The One of the last chapters of the book contains a detailed interview with retired Air Marshal Raghunath Nambiar, where we it takes more than 30 pages, about almost uh, 35, 40 43 pages. pages. 43 pages where we ask him pointed question. Now, he knew about the deal very well. He had audited that deal. And he tried to give a spin to the fact, saying there was nothing wrong, that this whole defense procurement procedure uh, was an impediment no. in speedy acquisition. But there again, within the armed forces, there are well laid down rules for emergency acquisition. None of that was followed. Mm -hmm. So in the interest of fairness, the reader should judge what uh, Air Marshal Raghunath Nambiar has said because he supports the deal, mm -hmm. whereas we have argued to the contrary. And let them arrive at their own conclusion because we, we believe that the national interest was not served. I'll add on. Yeah. I'll, 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 I'll tell yeah. you why, yeah. why the national... Can I, can, I, can I just add to that so that you take this into account as well? The original RFP, the request uh, for proposal, uh, for proposal, uh, was for 126 right. fighter aircraft, and this was not a number pulled out of the hat right. by the Indian Air Force. It came after a very long study. The RFP itself was a very detailed uh, document, spelled out the kind of aircraft and the numbers, which was to take into account the next 10, 20 years of development of the Air Force. Today, we are, we've got 36 aircraft, not the 126. Then you suddenly had a request for information calling for another 114 or 110 uh, aircraft. Nothing has happened in all these years on that. Precisely, that was I was about which to say. Which means that this 36 is going to leave a huge gap in your, in the teeth of your jaw. <laughs> if there are uh, hundred odd <laughs> aircraft missing. In fact, we have uh, argued it creates more problems than it right. solves. Yes, and not yeah. likely to yeah. come. So take that into account. Yeah. yeah. See, this uh, 126 aircraft requirement was proposed in 2000. Yeah. That's 22 years ago. That's right. This deal was announced in 2015. That is 15 years after that 126 uh, aircraft requirement was put on First moved in. First moved in. And the government says that this is an emergency procurement. So to say it's an emergency procurement, then what was the operating squadron strength on that time? Yeah. Right? 
And what is now? After you, you are bringing in 36 aircrafts in flyaway condition, what is the operational strength? And even in this 36, the so-called India-specific enhancements that uh, the IAF specially sure. needed, just not there. It's only there in one and it's, it's under testing now. It will take some more time to incorporate all these add-ons to the other 35. As of now, as per one of the senior Air Force officers, the current operational fleet strength is anywhere from 28 to 29. That's right. <laughs> Just because of that, the age-old fleet of MiG-21, they're going to operate till 2025. That's right. Right? In 2017, they issued a new RFI, cancelled it, reissued another one in 2018, and it's still at the RFI stage. That's right. There is no RFP. Right. So when they cancel, when they cancel, then request for proposal. When, right. when they when they cancel the previous deal, they said that this is lagging on since so uh, yeah. so many years. So we have to start a new process. So this new process, how many years it's going to take? That's right. So by the and time it comes in, other than LC, other than the with all the best intentions, if a new process is initiated now. It, it will take it will take a long time five to six years for it to even begin. Raghu, now, now, now the government supporters can argue that uh, uh, the government already placed the order for eighty uh, light uh, combat aircraft. That is stages, right. but as of now, the production capacity of HCL for uh, LCA is only six aircrafts per year. Well, but uh, that's one likely to be uh, yeah, that come is, up to no, twelve. If, to if I can that just is, add that, that, is, that, that yeah. is one. That is one. That is one. That is one. That is one point of it. Now, when we look at the segmentation of the these aircrafts, yeah, that I think is the important. That is the that is why that is why the Indian Air Force wanted MMRC. Yeah, yeah. That, in fact, I, I mean that's I've the medium hard. multi role that's combat it. aircraft. You I know, if, if I can just yes. add one point, let's assume for the time being that even if the deal was ninety percent done, that last ten percent proved to be a huge. Problem and the, the last mile was just not happening. It was taking yeah. too long. Let's assume there's a huge trust deficit between the Indian Air Force and Hindustan Aeronautics. You have worked with HAL, so you know. So let's assume all these things. Even if you assume all these things, this was just not the way to go about sure. it. The sheer arbitrariness, the sheer uh, decision taken by one man. And one other point I wanted to make. We, we have we have shown in our book that there were people within the defense ministry. There were people within the Ministry of Law and Justice who opposed different aspects, aspects, aspects of, of the agreement. But we were, we, we, we were bargaining from a very weak position. So whether it be the anti-corruption clauses or the seat of arbitration, we all eventually gave in to what the French wanted. That's right. And the other point that we make in this book is the role of the National Security Advisor, Mr. Ajit Doval, in this entire episode. Theoretically, he should have had nothing to do with this. Sure. But what we saw, show, there is enough evidence, there is ever enough documentary evidence and, and, and circumstantial evidence which points to that direction. Sure. I want to make one last point. This book is about 560 pages. It's got annexures, it's got a chronology, it's got an index, it's got... We have used information which is in the public domain. Yes. In case somebody says you are violating the Official Secrets Act, we have given references to each and every bit of information that is put. What we've tried to do is connect the dots. Yeah. Uh, last question. Uh, again, to do with uh, the national interests. Uh, as you have narrated throughout the book, brought out in many interviews uh, that you've done, uh, once that decision was taken to order the Rafats, then any interviews you did with sitting officials, military officials, <coughs> people in the press who were trying to defend the government's position were, as you said, post facto rationalizations. And in doing so, and I think all these interviews that you've got in your book show this, people tripping over themselves because at one point in speaking to you, he gives one uh, uh, excuse in speaking to you, he gives another, then he realizes there's a contradiction, so he gives a third. So this comes out very clearly in this. But one of the key arguments used 
for abandoning the RFP and going in for this emergency procurement was there were problems with Hindustan Aeronautics. HAL could not uh, strike the deal with Dassault. I understand the question. Let and me answer that. Yeah, yeah, just let me finish it for the benefit of the viewers. That because HAL was incompetent, inefficient, uh, incapable, uh, therefore it is better that HAL be abandoned and uh, a process goes where we give the contract to Dassault, who is free to hire uh, or link up with any private uh, partner. This is a running thread in the government's uh, dispensation. Raghu, uh, yeah. we managed to access the original RFP, 2007 right. original RFP. Right, which you've cited in many places. Yes, we have completely analyzed. It took almost eight months for because I'm not a technical person. Sure. So I had to seek the help of different people uh, in the know-how in the Air Force, retired, and uh, some working, they helped me a lot in this. Um, it very clearly states that anyone who is participating for this RFP and submitting the code, okay, they should be ready to work with, with HAL. That's right. one. Before submitting the code, they should go and assess HAL's capabilities, yeah. right? If you are not okay with this, your codes will be rejected. It was very clear in the RFP. Now, after becoming L1, if the so says that they can't work L1 with L1 is the lowest bit. That's yeah. If if they can't if they can't work with HAL, the government should have penalized as per the RFP. Government should have heavily penalized the so, and should have banned them for a few years. Mm. Actually, Dasso was doing arm twisting. It was very clearly stated in uh, the RFP that Dasso should give guarantee for 126 mm -hmm. aircrafts. Yeah. And after becoming the lowest bidder and after, uh, becoming the winner of the bid, then coming up with this, uh, this clause, yeah. the government should have banned them then itself in 2014 itself. Yeah. They didn't yeah. do that. That's right. one, that's one part of it. Now, second, when government and government officials and the ruling party members, uh, when they say that you know this is this is why the deal collapsed, it's tough to swallow as it is. The reason is, on twenty fifth March, Eric Trapier, the the so chairman, twenty fifth of March, two thousand fifteen, fifteen, two thousand fifteen, fifteen days prior to Prime Minister's announcement from France, uh, the so chairman. The then CEO, now chairman and CEO, uh, Eric Trapier, he praises HAL like, I mean, his experience with HAL that he was working with HAL uh, since uh, the early 90s and they were very cordial. Yeah. He was... But he, Trapier, yeah. Yeah. They, uh, they have a very cordial relationship and their, uh, you know, uh, efficiency. I mean, he was praising about HAL's efficiency <laughs> and oh, he was doing all this on the record in front of senior HAL officials, <coughs> the then Indian ambassador to France and senior government officials. We put out the video in public domain of this in 2019. It's still <coughs> available there. So if government says that uh, the source uh, reluctance to work with HAL was the reason, that's not acceptable. That's one. Second, much later, after all these things, in 2018-19, in a interview with uh, in an interview to for, in an interview with CNBC TV 18, Eric Trapier reiterates the same. Yeah. He says that he had no problem with HAL. So then, what happened? <coughs> he he categorically said, "You should ask your government. We had no problem." Yeah. yeah. So 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 clearly, Raghu, yeah. somebody is not telling you the whole truth. That's yeah. Right. So the, I mean, somebody is covering up. That's right. And these become excuses to justify a new deal that was announced. And, and, and then a jail chairman, Suvarna Raju, was categorical. When this um, uh, allegations came that, you know, uh, HAL's incapability is the reason and all this when um, uh, Mrs. Nirmala Sitaram and the current finance minister and the then defense minister said uh, this, Suvarna Raju was very, Mrs. Suvarna Raju was very clear. He, he challenged 
Yeah, he, he said right. make he the said work share agreement, work share agreement public, public. public. Yeah, that's right. And the government hasn't done it. No. No. Okay. I, I try to uh, speak to Mr. Sonaraju to take more details. He yeah. said that he's yeah. under pressure, he cannot say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's fair enough. I mean, he'll have his uh, reservations problems, uh, yeah. Yeah, in being able to speak. A last question. Your book has brought this entire story up to a point. We know all the uh, denials, uh, the obfuscation. It's uh, reached a dead end with the courts. It's reached a dead end with the CAG uh, and so on. Where do we go from here? And is there a prospect tomorrow or the day after of the reality behind the Rafal deal surfacing once again? Paranja. Uh, I think that's a difficult question to answer. What happens in France, only time can tell. As Ravi earlier pointed out, when the prosecutor's office sought to examine the documents with Dassault, with the French government, they were denied it. Now, how far that investigation will go, we cannot guess or second guess. What we know is even in France, there's clearly been a considerable amount of pressure on the investigating authority and we have detailed that in the book, how individuals move from one place to the other and... and Influence the... That's correct. Sure. So I think the depending political, on what How the political establishment yes. influenced the judiciary. Sure. And depending on what information comes out from there, and if at all there is some damaging information, then it would influence what will happen in India. Even during the review petition, the... One judge, they all agreed, all the three judges agreed, but one judge, Justice Joseph, K.M. Joseph, said, there is actually nothing even today preventing the CBI, the Central Bureau of Investigation, from going ahead. They have to follow certain norms because the Prevention of Corruption Act has been changed, but there's nothing really prevent, preventing the CBI from going ahead. I'll add one more thing to yeah. it. What happens in the case of what happened in the case of Bofors deal is uh, the continuous investigation by the Hindu and uh, the Swedish journalists. Your Enram uh, and uh, Chitra Subramaniam led that. Right now, what is happening is that uh, our the, the the self life of the news cycles. It's a day or two because every day something new comes up. And people forget the older thing. We started our investigation way back, uh, 2017, and we are still on to it. We are trying our best. And, uh, and uh, we believe, if, if at all, if this government changes in 2024, if another government comes in, they will open the file. Let us hope so. Well, on that, uh, somewhat optimistic uh, note. Uh, let me say that the story of Rafal may or may not unfold to reveal uh, the truth in the months and years uh, to follow. But the ramifications of the decision to change from the old RFP request for 126 fighter jets to 36 Rafals, the ramifications of that decision is already impacting and will continue to impact on the Indian Air Force and on India's defense preparedness in the years to come.